Good evening. Oh, it's working. Is it? That was not me. Is it the double microphones? No, it's good? Recent studies in major universities have proven conclusively that men and women don't get along. It was a long, exhaustive study over many years with thousands Do we need a microphone? No. Do we need a microphone? No. Um, okay. I, I don't know. I just talk. So the conclusion is pretty convincing. Men and women do not get along. Neither do I on microphones. Turn it way down and see what happens. So. When a man and a woman come and say that they're trying to develop a relationship, build a relationship, but it's not going so well, they're advised to go for therapy, counseling. But that's not such a good idea because there's no need. If they're not getting along, they're normal. When you find a man and a woman who do get along, now you got to worry. Somebody needs counseling, or maybe both. Because by nature, men and women don't get along. Trying to get along is like trying to fool Mother Nature, and that's not nice. I mean, a guy writes a book, and the title is Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. Do you need to read the rest of the book? That's pretty convincing. Give it up. You're from two different planets, and reading the rest of the book is not going to change that. Men are better off without women. You don't have to agree in public, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> And women are better off without men. Because it's much easier to be a woman when you don't have to adjust to male shtick. And it's much easier to be a male when you don't have to compromise to understand and get to know the other gender. See, that's probably why God invented marriage. Because marriage is a magical thing. When you get married, the man is transformed into a husband. And the woman is transformed into a wife. This is such a dramatic change, such a powerful change, that you go actually from one extreme to the other. A man and a woman are better off without each other. A husband and a wife cannot exist without each other. A man without a woman is a healthier man. A husband without a wife is not a better husband. He's not a husband at all. So where they were better off separate, now they define each other.
There is no husband without a wife. There is no wife without a husband. Modern culture has convinced us that a man and a woman belong together. You know, male, female, yin and yang. They were never supposed to be together. The understanding of yin and yang and is to tell you how different they are and how to keep them separate so that they don't clash and destroy each other. What's really amazing, which we hardly ever stop to think, do you love your wife more than your mother? Your wife is going to ask you sooner or later. Do you love your husband more than your father? Do you love your spouse more than your children? It's a silly question. Because it's not a question of more, it's a completely different emotion. So we use the word love recklessly, irresponsibly. Every child says, I love my mommy, I love Mickey Mouse or Barney, and I love ice cream. You're getting only a third of the, sli of the pie, you know. <laughs> so you have to share your child's love with Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse. <laughs> You're not, you're not getting a small piece of the love. You have to, we really should have different words. A child who enjoys Mickey Mouse should have a different word for it. You can't call it love. Because if it really is love, this kid's a little disturbed. Wait till he finds out that Mickey Mouse is a fake character and he's in love with a fake character. Heartbreaking. Ice cream, you don't love ice cream. Why? Because it can't love you back. So the word love really should not apply to ice cream as much as you love it. You have to find a different word. There are so many different kinds of love. And to lump them all together and confuse these very different emotions, very different experiences, leaves us really damaged. The love of you have for a child is not the same love you have for a spouse. They don't compete. They're in different sections of the heart. They follow different pathways in your chakras. It's a different emotion. It's a different reality. And thank God, we have the capacity for a wide array of loves. A mother's love is not the same as love for a husband. Love for a parent, it's a different emotion. So let's try to understand them a little bit so that we understand what a relationship is and what it's supposed to be. In the Song of Songs, in Shir Hashirim, there are a number of descriptions that express a longing, an attachment, a devotion, uh, a, a seeking of closeness, a pursuit of closeness. And you might think that poetically, these are just different ways of saying the same thing. Like, ahavo kamayim, love like water. But then again, there's ahavo kirish peish, love like a flaming fire. There's ahavo that wakes you up at night. There is ava that is as dear as life. 
These are not different ways of saying the same thing. These are completely different emotions. But let's focus just on two of them. There's a love that is like water. Water flows peacefully, gently, continuously. If you interrupt or block the water, you create a disturbance. It's, it's not pleasant. But then there's love like fire. What is fire? Constantly moving, very intense. It consumes everything it touches. So if you have love like water and you have love like fire, they have to be very different emotions. The relationship between a parent and a child, between siblings, is like water. It's natural, it's peaceful, it's pleasant, and it's continuous. If you interrupt the relationship between a brother and sister, it doesn't make it better. If you disturb it, it doesn't enhance the love. On the contrary, it causes pain. Love between a husband and wife is like fire. It is intense, it is stormy, it is a little unpredictable. It rises, it settles down, it rises again, it flares up. Sometimes it even looks like it went out and then all of a sudden it's back. Why are they so different? Hus uh, siblings are by nature close. They're born close. There is no great distance that they need to overcome. And so the love between them, the energy that they, in, that they in exchange is a calm one, a confident one, a secure one. The negative side, it's a little boring. There's no drama. And that's good. That's how it's supposed to be. Drama between a brother and sister is not welcome. It's not supposed to happen. Husband and wife are naturally strangers. Actually, when, when God told Adam and Chava to be intimate, they were shocked. Because it doesn't seem natural. If you're going to get married, a man should marry a man, and a woman should marry a woman. What is this crossing over this huge divide? How is it going to work? So they must have been pretty shocked. The love between them is of a completely different energy, completely different nature, because the whole point of the love between a, a husband and a wife is the bridging of the distance. In this case, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Absence of a brother and sister doesn't. But between a husband and a wife, the distance itself stimulates and demands a more intense love. Because it's a longer bridge So the, fi the love then becomes like a fire. It's intense. The intensity is the, uh, the duality of it. We are strangers, we are family. We are family, we are strangers. Not only because we weren't born together, but because men and women, Mars and Venus. So every time you think you've bridged the gap, and you've made connection, you discover that, no, you're still very different. So the, the closeness, the distance, two sides of the relationship. That's why the love also rises and falls. 
when I feel really close, it settles down. Then I realize, no, 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 we're still strangers. <laughs> like the, the guy says, I'm already married. Why do I have to be nice? And he discovered <laughs> the hard way why he better be nice, even though they're already married. So when I feel really content, really comfortable, really close, then the love settles down. When I realize, no, we're still from different planets, and we still have to reach across this distance, the love flares up. And that's actually good for the relationship. If a husband and wife settle into a habit or a pattern of love like siblings, this is not good. Not supposed to be that way. Everything in the physical is a reflection of something in the spiritual. How do we know what a relationship is supposed to be like? How do we know what coming together over great distances is supposed to, is supposed to work? We know it from God himself. For example, a man says to a woman, please marry me. He's desperate. Please marry me. I can't live without you. Should she marry him? Or should she run away? Or suggest therapy? Because this woman once said, I don't trust, I don't trust men. I learned not to trust men. Because I had a boyfriend, and he said that if I ever left him, he would kill himself. So I left him. <laughs> Can't trust men. Promises, promises. So if a guy says, please marry me, I can't live without you, wait a week and see what happens. <laughs> if he doesn't die, he's a liar. If he does, no more questions. <laughs> so now imagine a man says to a woman, please marry me, I can live without you. Nice guy. Honest, single, <laughs> you can live without me, go right ahead. So what should a man say? He should say what God said when he offered to marry us. It's a very romantic relationship. God said, please be mine. I can exist without you. I'm God. <laughs> I am infinite. I am all-powerful, all-knowing. I've always been. I always will be. I can exist well without you. But without you, my entire existence has no meaning. So what should a man say to a woman? Please marry me. I can exist without you, but what kind of a life would that be? It's not a life. If you marry me, my existence will become a life. This really solves an important issue, an important problem. When are you ready to get married? When you feel incomplete? Why would you want to marry someone who's incomplete? Grow up and we'll talk. <laughs> On the other hand, if he's already complete, what does he need you for? This is a serious question. Any guy who offers to marry you, you've got to be suspicious. You know that famous um, Groucho Marx line? 
I would never join a country club that would accept me as a member. <laughs> Why would you ever want to marry a man who wants to marry you? You got to ask, what's wrong with him? If he's a mensch, what does he need me for? If he's not a mensch, what do I need him for? That's where we get so confused. You marry a guy who's not a mensch, and you'll make a mensch out of him. That's not a marriage. That's a nursery. So this resolves the problem. You don't marry a man who can't exist without you. Because then he's just a shlomazel. But even if he can exist without you, he needs you to give his existence meaning. Because just to be, even if you be well, what's the point? So imagine you're God. You're infinite, you've always existed, you will always exist. You cannot be bigger, you cannot be stronger, you cannot be smaller. You can't die, you can't get old. You are perfect. That's today. And tomorrow, perfect. And the next day, perfect. How would you like to be God? You're already perfect. Where do you go from there? I mean, it's nice to say God is infinitely big. He can't be any bigger. Then what can he be? That's it. It's over. Infinity is a dead end. Because where do you go from there? There is no beyond infinity. So once you reach infinity, there is no going any further. That's the problem with being God. That's why nobody wants to be God. We want to have God run the world and take the credit to ourselves. So when I say I'm God, I don't mean I'm doing the job. I don't want the job. But when you have an infinitely good existence, you feel so intensely the need to fill all of that with some meaning. See, when your existence is not so good, you really don't know how to open a jar or fry eggs, well, then you got, you got, you got to get busy. You can't marry somebody else. You've got to solve your own issues first. So you're busy. But once you can exist well, once you have a perfect existence, now you have to face the question, the depressing question, the existential question. Now what? What for? So what? So I have the big house. I have all the money, I'm famous, I'm popular, I'm powerful, I have enough money to live on for the next thousand years. So what? Now what? I went to visit Jews in prison in New York. I met a guy there whose sentence is 850 years. That was his sentence. He's in his 70s. He says, they think they're going to keep me here for 800 years? I'll, I'll tr <laughs> I will foil their plans. I'm not going to live that long. So they can't do it to me. So if you have a perfect existence, why would you want to go on? So when God asks us to marry him, he's basically saying, you have an existence, I have an existence, but if we're separate, the existence will become depressing. Because existence demands content. Give me some purpose, give me something meaningful to make my existence justified. 
It's a strange thing that people cannot exist without a life. Many years ago, a suicidal woman said to me, I'm going to kill myself. There's no meaning. Everything is meaningless. There's no point. There's nothing important. There's nothing valuable. It's all nothing. So being a wise, a wise Alec yeshiva boy, I said, no meaning? Nothing means anything? She says, absolutely not. I said, in that case, why do you have to kill yourself? Sit. Eventually you'll die. What's with the drama? You have to kill yourself. It's all meaningless. People can't do it. If you really feel that your existence is meaningless, you hate your own existence. You can't tolerate it. Where do we get this insanity from? What's wrong with just hanging out for 80 years? For no reason. As long as you're here, stay here. Where do you want to go? We get this from God. We are created in God's image and we cannot stand having a good existence without a content. A tachlis. What gives existence tachlis? You need to be bigger than yourself. To just be me, well, I was created me. And that's it? Can't. Can't stand it. But if I become bigger than me, because I become part of something bigger, now my existence is justified. What is bigger? First of all, the chain, the infinite chain of parent and child, family, of birth, family, of origin, family that you create. This is a long chain. You become part of that chain, you're part of something very big. But that doesn't even compare to how big it is into the future. Because we can continue to have children infinitely. Every child can have a child. <coughs> so already, just by joining the chain of worlds, of families, you're already part of something bigger. <coughs> I'll tell you a quick story. I'll tell it to you quickly. It's not a quick story. I came to Minnesota very enthusiastic, idealistic, young, impatient, because <coughs> I was very excited about teaching and, and helping and reaching out and so on and so forth. I get a phone call from a high school girl who says, we're discussing intermarriage in our class. We had a, a priest come and speak about the Catholic view. There was a minister who spoke about the Protestant view. But there are Jews in the class, and we would like to have the Jewish view. So would you come? This is 1971. This girl never saw me. I never saw her. She looked it up in the phone book, a rabbi, that's it. She wants a rabbi. So of course I was very excited. This is my first speaking engagement on a very significant subject. I'm, I'm there, I'm, in, I'm into it. The day comes for the uh, appointment and I was trying to decide what to wear. Men also have that problem, don't they? <laughs> I'm going to speak to a high school. So what am I going to wear? A three-piece suit? A tuxedo? Nah. So I got a leather jacket. And I, I went off to the class. 
This is in a suburb of Minneapolis, really urban, I mean rural. So rural that in the warm months, two of them, <laughs> some of the kids come to school on horseback. So we're talking out there. 2,000 students in the school, four of them are Jewish. And two of the four are in this class. Two girls. I walk into the classroom and my heart stops. The priest is there and the minister is there. No, this is not a joke. I had misunderstood. They didn't already speak. They both had agreed to speak, but it was going to be a panel. <clears throat> had I known, I would have refused because it's against our policy. We don't sit on interfaith panels. But I, I was already in the room. So here I'm feeling really, really guilty. My first event and I already blew it. They find out that I'm doing this, I'll get fired, I'm, that's it, it's all over. And I'm, I'm, really, I'm really very distraught about it. To make matters worse, the teacher comes over and says, we only have 45 minutes. Each of you will speak for five minutes. To speak for five minutes, you gotta prepare. I hadn't prepared. I never speak for five minutes. <laughs> this is getting increasingly disturbing. Now, for some reason, see, I was shocked to see them there because I didn't expect them to be there. They did expect a rabbi, and yet for some reason when I walked in, they were a little shocked. They never saw a rabbi. Yeah, so this, this apparent, the beard with the, with that, with the leather jacket. With... <laughs> and they're both old enough to be my father. <laughs> they ask me if I want to speak first. They don't know what to do with me. You want to sit? You want to stand? You want to, what do you want to do? And I said, no, 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 no. You, you go first. Because I'm really upset. The priest spoke for about five minutes, and he said, you're not allowed to intermarry. If you intermarry, the church cannot recognize the marriage. But if you do, raise the children Catholic to save their soul. About five minutes. Then the minister spoke. He said, marriages are difficult. The divorce rate is going up. This is 1970, can you imagine? They were already nervous back then. Uh, so it's difficult. The last thing you need to do is add another tension and another, by marrying somebody from a different faith, it's not going to work. About five minutes. Now I have to get up. I stand there in front of the classroom and I'm completely paralyzed. I'm panicked. This is wrong. I don't belong here. This is a disaster. <laughs> But I have to say something. So if you've never had the experience, let me tell you what this is like. My brain is numb. I cannot think of a single thing to say. But there are 40 students looking at me with their mouth open like, got to say something. So what happens, this is, this is a lesson in, in uh, human nature, what happens is, you have to speak. So your mouth starts to talk. And your brain is thinking, where are you going? <laughs> what are you saying? <laughs> so I said, I don't understand why we're talking about intermarriage. For, this, is, this is the 70s. Nobody bothers getting married anymore. You live together, you like it, you stay, you don't, you quit. These kids never saw a rabbi before. 
<laughs> the look on their faces, that's a rabbi? <laughs> the priest got upset, and he interrupts, and he says, that's living in sin. You're not allowed to do that. I said, that's what people are doing. So what's the difference whether it's inter or not inter? There's no marriage. No more marriage. Cover story, Time magazine said, marriage is passe. It was the 70s. These very polite kids respectfully try to convince me that you have to get married. One boy says, I can't remember all of them, but one boy says, Human beings are not meant to live alone. You need companionship. I said, fine. One companionship, two companionship, all you want. <laughs> but why marriage? A girl says, when I, when I graduate, I will want to find somebody to support me. I said, why are you going to school? Get good grades, support yourself. One after the other, they're giving me arguments for in favor of marriage, and I'm just dismissing them because I don't know what to say. So I'm just stalling. I, I, I don't know what I'm saying. Finally, one girl says, you know, when you have a baby, the baby should have a mother and a father. I'm completely out of control. I said, have babies? Nobody has babies anymore. Haven't you heard of birth control? <laughs> The priest got upset, <laughs> and he interrupts, and he says, that's unnatural, it's forbidden, and so on. 25 minutes later, the students, and the, the two Jewish girls are cracking up. They can't, they can't stop laughing, and the other girls are like, what's funny? 25 minutes later, the students say, so, so why do we get married? So I said, the only reason I know is because God told Adam and Eve to get married, to be monogamous. And since then, with very few exceptions, all over the world, people get married because it's the way we heard it should be, so we marry. And then I thought of something to say. <laughs> I'm slow, but I get there. I said, that's why you should not intermarry. Because the whole reason for marrying is to live the way God wants. So don't marry somebody he doesn't want. Either do it or don't do it. But you can't make a Seder on Pesach night and serve bread. You don't want to make a Seder, fine. The bell rings, class is over. Before I could turn around, the priest is gone. Out the door. The minister, I tell you, is old enough to be my father, says very, very seriously, can I walk you out to the car? And I thought, oh, now I'm in trouble. <laughs> this guy's offended. He's gonna, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, we're walking down this long corridor, you know, a high school building with the, with the lockers on both sides, and he's not saying anything. Like, lost in thought. Finally, after making me very nervous, finally he says, what, what you were saying there in the classroom is that from the Old Testament? I said, it's the only one I've read. <laughs> he says, you know, we spend much too much time with the New Testament. Who was I to argue? So we became friends. From time to time, he calls me with questions and so on. But the punchline of the story is, why do we get married? In the 21st century, only because it's a divine idea. It's not a human invention. 
It's not even a good idea. I see you know what I mean. <laughs> it's not a good idea. It's a ridiculous idea. But it has divine holiness. It has a divine purpose. It's a reflection of the divine. God marries us cosmically. We get married individually, personally. In order to reflect this duality, this fiery love, the love that comes from the fact that we are one and yet we're not one. We are close, yet there's great distance. We are familiar with each other, and yet we must, must leave each other room. These two sides, that seems like a conflict, but it's really the richness of the relationship, which is why it's like a fire, the flame rising, the flame falling, and so on. Since that's the nature of the spiritual side of our relationship, it is to be reflected in our physical relationship as well. So God tells us, in a relationship between husband and wife, the emotions must be stormy, not consistent and smooth, on again, off again, up and down. And therefore, in the physical relationship, Two weeks you are intimate physically, two weeks you're not. Two weeks back and forth, following the rhythm of the body, of the, of the monthly cycle. So now all of a sudden everything is coming together. The nature of this love that makes it different from other loves. The physical condition of the, of the womb when it's receptive when it's not receptive. And the practice of mikvah, when physically you are together, physically you're not together. The, the physical rhythm actually supports the emotional system and the spiritual rhythm. So without the separation, without the mikvah, it would become brother-sister or worse. It would become um, incompatible. Since we don't have brother-sister relationship and we're not following the pattern of husband-wife relationship, everything goes sour. Which explains the reason that marriages have become so challenging, so difficult, so frustrating. You can't fool Mother Nature. For many, many, many years, we thought that mikvah was a purely spiritual thing for religious and holy people. But we're realizing more and more, nothing in the Torah is otherworldly. Nothing. Because there can't be two truths. You can't have a truth for your soul and a different truth for your body. You can't have one truth in heaven, another truth on earth. They must come together. And in fact, that is the whole purpose of creation, to bring heaven and earth together, to bring God and his creation together, to bring him and us into an intimate relationship so that the distance is bridged. The gap is filled. So the invention of mikvah is a natural outgrowth of what is true in heaven must also be true on earth. What is true in your heart must also be true in your body. So what we need to do is find a living pattern a behavior pattern that matches the emotion that we are supposed to be feeling. Now, I'm sure you've heard many times, people who keep mikvah, every month it's like getting married all over again and you never get bored and it's like... (laughs) 
if that were so simple, everybody would be happily married. If that's all it takes, everyone would be doing it. Really interesting that in all the sex therapy, almost every method that they, that they have, every system, begins with the instruction not to touch each other for two weeks. Which really doesn't make sense. A couple come to a therapist because they're having a problem in their intimate life. They're bored, they're not interested, nothing's happening. So the therapist says, okay, so don't touch each other for two weeks. And all of a sudden, uh, it's getting better. Why is that? Are we so oppositional? Oh, you tell us not to? Okay, now we want to. No. The reason that people get bored and get, become dysfunctional <laughs> is not that they're bored. The relationship is no longer an exciting one because it has become brother-sister or just plain blah. So although they still like each other, there's no fire. Jackie Mason says, Jackie Mason says, I come to California and everybody's sitting around in cafes. Nobody's working. Nobody's got a job. I said, what's going on? What do you people do? They're all producers. They're producing a movie. And they're all sitting around, you know the shtick, right? They're all sitting around trying to decide where to put the sex scene. So he asks them, why does every movie have to have a sex scene? And they say, because it's you know, simulating real life. And in uh, real life, people have sex. He says, yeah, but people also have soup. <laughs> So why doesn't a movie have to have a soup scene? <laughs> I mean, he tells it like a joke. I take it seriously. <laughs> yeah, really, why? That's the philosopher, you know. Why, if there's a sex scene, it sells, and if there's a soup scene, it doesn't sell? Come on, there's got to be a deep explanation here. In a marriage where the, the fire has gone out, it's because their relationship has become soup. The difference between intimacy and soup, if you don't already know, actually there was a, a teenage boy, came for Shabbos to Chabad house. He was an obnoxious, arrogant kid who thought he was a gift to all women. One of those, you know? <laughs> so I walked over to him and I said, I, I've, I've had this question for a long time. Maybe you can explain it to me. What is the difference between sex and soup? He says, I, 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 I don't know. I said, really, I'm so disappointed. I mean, of all people, I thought you would know. You don't know the difference between sex and soup? He says, no. I said, then stay out of my kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> what is the difference between sex and soup? Soup is a thing that you can own. It's an object. You can buy it. You can steal it. It's yours. Soup is good food. So if you want to eat it and enjoy it, you'll enjoy it. You don't want, throw it away. Nobody's going to tell you what to do with your soup. Intimacy is not like that. Intimacy you cannot own. You never have possession. You never have rights. You never have license 
You never have a claim to another person's intimacy. So everybody says, why, after three dates you expect intimacy? What do you think I am? After four dates, we'll talk. Five dates, no. No amount of dates earns you any kind of intimacy because intimacy is not a thing you can own. It's not a thing. I'll explain in a minute. So when does a man have rights to intimacy? How about if he promises to marry her? Now? No. How about if he actually bought her a ring? No. What if they are married? No. I know, now you tell me. <laughs> How about they've been married for 40 years? No. Never, ever, at all. The definition of intimacy is two people with nothing between them. Intimacy means I need you, not something from you, not something about you, just you. And let me show you how sad this is when you lose it. A mother says, I don't get along with my teenage daughter. We're just not, not communicating, we're not getting along. I said, from now on, whenever you go out on an errand, shopping, whatever, ask your daughter to come with you. She said, for what? I said, for nothing. She's sitting home alone, you're going out, ask her to come with you so that you'll be together. She says, what would we talk about? I mean, is this sad? What will we talk about? I said, you always prepare speeches for your daughter? Don't talk about anything. I said, so, so, what, so, so what for? Because it's your daughter. So now you see where the problem is. They can't connect to each other. They've always been connecting through something. If you need this from me and I need that from you, but just, mm, just us, that's uncomfortable. <clears throat> Between mother and daughter. This is what intimacy means. It's just us. It's me and you with nothing for nothing. Just us. That's everything. Nothing is everything. That's intimacy. Tevye, Rabbi, Rabbi Tevye, asks his wife Golda, do you love me? You remember? She says, do I what? He says, do you love me? She says, for 25 years I've, whatever, goes through a whole list. For 25 years, for 25 years, if that's not love, then what is? So listen to the wisdom of her answer. He says, do you love me? Are you giving me your love? She says, I'm giving you me. I'm yours. All you're thinking about is love? You have all of me. That is the wisdom of intimacy. Love is an object. You have it, you don't have it. You have more, you have less. It's a thing. Nothing should ever come between husband and wife. Even physical pleasure, sexual pleasure, it's a thing. You can read books on it, how to have more, how to have less, how to have better. It's a thing, it's a project. It comes between husband and wife. Intimacy means we just want to be 
with each other on all levels and all ways, but it's us, not some thing. A love that is dependent on some thing will not last. A love that is dependent on no thing will last forever. We have lost and we need to develop this talent for absolute connection, just us. So what happens in the bedroom? Nothing happens, it's them. It's him and her, that's all. And when nothing comes between you, then you really do become one. Without the mikveh, without that pattern, without that rhythm, objects, something, becomes more important than the person you're with. So for example, seeing someone's body enhances the intimacy, increases the intimacy, or damages the intimacy. It is so logical, it's so logical that nobody understands it. <laughs> the more obvious and the more logical something is, the more brilliant you have to be to come up with it. What does the eye see? The eye sees objects. The eye doesn't see personality, it only sees objects. So if you look at me, all you know is what? You don't know who. The difference between intimacy and non-intimacy, intimacy means I'm connected to who you are. Opposite intimacy means I'm connected to what you are. Of course, seeing is stimulating. But what is, what is the stimulation? What are you excited about? You're excited about what you see. And what you see is not a person. It's something. So if you're going to make a bumper sticker, the bumper sticker should say, nothing you get from your husband can be as important as your husband. If that's not love, what is? Nothing about your wife can ever be as important as your wife. That's what separates intimacy from pornography. Pornography means it's about something. I want something from you. I want something about you. And even if I love everything about you, it's, porno it's pornography. Because it's not things about me. What about me? So when Tevye says, do you love me? Golda is thinking, oh, is that what you want? I thought you were interested in me. You want love? Go to your mother. So here's another shocking thing. Stop looking for love. It's, it's, it's destructive. It's horrible. You don't need love from your husband. You don't need love from your wife. Because marriage is not about love. You don't need love from your children. Because if you do, you're very immature. You need your children's love, not love from your children. What is the difference? <laughs> Immense. If you need love from your children and they don't give you love, you'll go looking for love from somebody else's children. Nobody ever does that because we don't need love from children. We need our children's love and that I can't get from anybody else's children. I don't need love. I need a oneness with another human being. 
when I connect and become one with another human being, then of course her love becomes important. But because it's her love, and I want her, now everything about her becomes important, but only because it's her. If the thing about her becomes more important than her, then I am married to it, not to her. See, I figured this out. It took me years. Because the first encounter I had with a marriage counseling, the man said, I'm getting divorced. I don't need this. I'm trying to figure, what is this? I had never heard such an expression. So I said to him, wait, wait you're divorcing her because you don't need this? Get rid of this. Why are you getting rid of her? He didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> he never connected to her. He got married because he thought, yeah, this is good. Well, this is not good, so he's going to try some of that. She, just a tool. That's sad. If you connect to her, you never want to lose her. It really is a bond. You create an opening in your heart that wasn't there before. It's an untapped love that you haven't used. Different, different channels, different feeling, different energy, different sensation. It's a whole new thing. And that's why people who live together happily for five, six, seven years, and then get married, three months later they're divorced. Because now they need a different love and they haven't found it. They're using the old love of people to serve the love of husband and wife, of oneness. It's not the same love. It's not the same. So the mikvah, which is such a divinely brilliant concept. Not the mikvah, the separation. And then the coming back together. It doesn't guarantee that your life is going to be wonderful unless you, the rest of the picture is clear. You know how this matches your emotions. So we learned the hard way. The average couple in America are intimate once a month if they're lucky. It's, it's so funny when you tell non-observant Jews, you know, we are intimate only for two weeks out of every month, and they say, oh, that's terrible. Two weeks? You can't even touch each other? Well, how often are you intimate? Well, you know, we both work and... <laughs> If it happens once a month, we're happy. <laughs> this is terrible. Can't fool Mother Nature. So when God says, take a two-week break, it's not to stop you, to, st to stifle you, to weaken your intimacy. On the contrary, it is there to support and match the intimacy that only husband and wife have. What about the mikveh itself? A big pool of water, and you immerse yourself in the water, and it covers you. What, what, what is the point here? We have showers. We're clean. We don't need a bath. The point of it is this. In order to be able to connect to another person, without anything, to love someone for no reason at all, just the person, to get beyond all the things that interested you in the first place, because why did you marry the person you married? You saw things you liked, character traits, looks, bank account, 
good things. So you have to choose your spouse based on things. And then all of a sudden you're married and those things are no longer relevant. Now it's just us. No things. How do you do that? What quality enables you to let another person into your life, not in exchange for anything, not with a condition of some thing, but totally, completely, you are no longer yourself, you are now an us. What enables you to do that? What enables us to do this, surprisingly, is that we were created from the earth. We have very humble beginnings. When a person says, but I need this, I need that, I don't have enough of this, I don't have enough of that, the cure for greed is humility. Remember your humble beginnings and you'll realize you don't need, stop it. You're simple, life is simple, you don't need all these things. And that humbles you to where you suddenly have room for another person in your life. Or the other person becomes your life. That is a, an immense divine talent. To be able to get past the self to become an us. Being submerged underwater brings out our humility. Not cleanliness, our humility. When we go back to being nothing, like when the, when the water covered the earth, we are made of earth. When we're submerged underwater, we are back to our most primordial condition. The most humble, the most, um, the most organic condition. Now we are ready to open ourselves up to an entirely new person who is welcome to invade our space. Generally, we protect our space desperately, like this town ain't big enough for the two of us. Stranger in town? Uh-oh. Well, it's a big town. Calm down. No. It's my town or your town, not big enough for the two of us. Every stranger is suspect, simply because they're present. What are you doing in my world? And they're not even married. So when two people get married and invade each other's space completely, how are you supposed to tolerate that? The only thing that allows us to do it is the humility. The humility that affects even the body. So a person who says, look, I'm not arrogant. I'm a nice person. I'm, a comfortab I'm comfortable with other people. What, what, I don't need the mikvah. It's the body that reacts. Your body tenses when there's a stranger, when there's somebody else, when somebody has invaded your space. The mikvah makes even the body humble enough to allow another person into the same space. So then people ask, so why don't men go to the mikvah? Well, first of all, men should. But more than that, what is more humbling than a man being told you cannot be intimate with your wife until she has done something? You can't even go to the mikvah. You have to wait for her. The message behind all of this, which is lost, the relationship between a man and a woman, husband and wife, is the dance of life. Without that, there's no life. The world is finished. 
in this dance of life, what starts the music? The man or the woman? On the surface, the man marries the woman. The man proposes to the woman. The man puts a ring on her finger. He writes a document committing himself to... It's his mitzvah. So the man does everything. He has to pursue you. He lost a rib, let him go find it. But that's only on the surface. Just beneath the surface, the woman's receptivity is irresistible to men. Medr says an interesting thing. God cursed Chava after eating from the tree that she will yearn for a husband. Part of the punishment. Never mind how it fits the crime. You eat a fig, you yearn for your husband. Don't even, go, don't even try to figure that one out. <laughs> I don't know what figs has to do with anything, but, but the Medrash says, look what happens when God curses. God curses the woman that she will yearn or hunger for a man, for a husband. And the result is, when men hear that women hunger for a husband, they all go crazy trying to find a wife. Because that kind of yearning is irresistible to a man. To be welcomed, to be nurtured like that, irresistible. So what exactly is this dance of life? The, the entire relationship between a husband and wife starts with the wife. And it is visible, physical, in the cycle of the womb. So what are the laws of mikvah? I mean, just say it in simple English, demystified. When the womb is not in the mood, there's no intimacy. When the womb is in the mood, there's intimacy. How humbling is that to the man who stands there helpless? To be a nurturer, which women are, is a very powerful force, like a vacuum. If you have the capacity to nurture, you're irresistible. And how does nurturing happen? Effortlessly. You don't do anything to nurture. You simply invite. You let someone into your world and they blossom. Some women have a huge capacity. They can actually nurture a whole community. And everyone feels like they are your best friend. And just being near you makes them, makes them come alive. Nurturing doesn't mean you feed and you diaper and you, and you do dishes. Now, you can hire someone for that. Nurture means you don't have to do anything. When a kid comes home, he lights up. Because your space is nurturing. When the Rebetzin passed away, the Rebbe's wife, 1978. Huh? 87. The woman who worked in the house was crying hysterically. It was a little surprising because she wasn't that close. So they asked her, why, why are you so, you weren't so close with the Debitson. And she said, I'm not crying for her. I'm crying for him. What's he going to do without her? She was in the house in the evenings. 
She says, I saw the Rebbe come home at night with a huge shopping bag full of work, letters of heartbreak, of suffering, of problems, of homework. And you could see the weight of the world on his shoulders. But when he walked into the house and he saw her, he lit up. The burden dropped away. He was home. What is he going to do without her? That is the nature of the attraction of a woman to a man. The woman is the home. Home is the woman. When a husband comes home, he has to feel that. He has to realize, now I'm at peace. I'm where I belong. I'm home. Not to come home and feel burdened, but unburdened. When you walk past the door of your house and you kiss the mezuzah, the outside world dies. That's over. Now you're home. That is the exact opposite of a guy who lives in the office, lives for his career, and he comes home and is annoyed if something is expected of him. Because he already has his life outside. That's not a family. When both work, husband and wife, this, this problem doubles. They both come home having had their life. They don't understand what they need each other for. So the mikveh prevents that from happening if we're mindful. The mikveh says the humility and the receptivity that a woman has is irresistible to a man. When you're hungered for, when you are nurtured, and you come home to your nurturer, they don't have to do anything. Nothing has to happen. And they bond. The waters of the mikveh, the power of water, which is still unexplored, but the Torah, the creator of the water, knows the power of the water. And a shower or a bath is not the same idea. The shower and the bath is personal and selfish. The mikveh is total selfless. So to get into a relationship where selflessness is the key, the mikveh being submerged does that. And that's why men, even men who don't often go to the mikveh, but Erev Yom Kippur, in preparation for Yom Kippur, you go to the mikveh. You've got to get your body as humble as your soul so that Yom Kippur can be meaningful. If men go more often, it's better. So what effect does this have on children? This is scary. If the bond between husband and wife are not strong, it leaves the child insecure. I don't know if this is a good, a good analogy, but you put a child on a bike for the first time and the two wheels are not connected well. So if the two wheels are not really joined, what's going to happen to this kid? He's in trouble now. The wheels are going to come apart. He's going to fall. It's a disaster. If husband and wife do not really bond, and then a child comes down from heaven and sits on this bond, and it breaks, or it's shaky, it's insecure, unconsciously the child feels it. Now the child's upset. We see in recent times a development I don't think ever happened before. Children at a very young age resent the fact that they were born. Every rebellious teenager. I didn't ask to be born. 
So should we undo it? We can rectify that, you know. They don't care. This is scary. So what? I didn't ask to be born. I don't care. I don't think we've ever heard that from children before. Years back, children said, you're not the boss of me. I have my own life. OK, not so terrible. But I didn't even ask to be born. I don't want to be alive. Now, this is scary. What does that come from? From not feeling welcomed. Husband and wife have intimacy. They're both consumed by their own experience, trying to have a better experience, the greatest experience. And then a baby comes in, does not feel welcome. That's not a good thing. You see this in television often. Husband comes home, and he's surprised there are candles on the table. Dinner. He says, what's happening? She says, I have a surprise. What? I'm pregnant. And he says, I can't believe it. I... Weren't you there? <laughs> Did this happen without you? What's the surprise? So the child, being completely conscious, even from the moment of conception, the child says, oh, you weren't expecting me? I'm sorry. Doesn't feel welcome. OK, you can compensate. You say, no, 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 I really, yeah, I, I really meant for you to be born. No, you didn't. The mikveh turns a relationship between a man and a woman into a marriage. It creates a, a, a rhythm that nurtures the relationship on the emotional level, which nurtures the relationship on the spiritual level. The coming together of opposites that never quite blend, but keep coming together, on, off, apart, together. That rhythm is actually the rhythm of life. How do we breathe? In, out, back, and forth. The heartbeat, it's life itself. So if our bodies are not following that same rhythm, then we're out of sync. There's no harmony. And that, of course, creates all sorts of disturbances. So one final story. There was a famous Rebbe back in Europe, the Kotzke Rebbe. And to make a long story short, they once asked him, you know your chassidim so well, such intimate insight into their personalities. How about your son? And the Kotzke Rebbe said, how do I know my son? How well do I know my son? I know, with what, I know with what thoughts I invited him into this world. When we started to study Tanya, to learn Hasidus, for some strange reason, our teacher told us this story. We were 16, 17, and we were a little shocked. Not exactly the kind of story you tell little boys that he knew with what thoughts he invited him into. In other words, at the moment of conception, he knew what he was thinking. Why would the rabbi tell us such a story? Didn't seem appropriate. But a few years later, when we were getting married, that story came back so powerfully. That's called family planning. When a community gets together to build a mikvah, that's family planning. Now you see 
how awesome, how holy, and how important what happens in the bedroom is. Because it can't happen in the bedroom unless a community spends big bucks to build a mikveh so that there can be that kind of a bond between husband and wife. You sell the Torah if you can't afford to build a mikveh. Because the mikveh is more important than the Torah for a very simple reason. Without Jewish children, who's going to study the Torah? And for Jewish children to be born with every benefit, the mikveh, indispensable. So when you hear these, 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 um, these slogans, yeah, you go to the mikveh, it's like being starting all over again. N not if you have no idea what it is. But once we understand, once we get into the rhythm, now our emotions are healthier. Now we don't turn intimacy into soup. Because once you make it soup, nobody cares anymore, including you. So what prevents your intimacy from becoming soup? You're too familiar with soup. You own it. It's too mundane. Intimacy must remain a little beyond your reach because you can't own it. And if it's a little bit beyond your reach, then you have to extend yourself. That intensifies the love. The love is intensified. It becomes real intimacy. You're not looking for something from each other. You just want to have each other. And that's why your grandmother was right. She's always right. When you asked your grandmother as a little girl, you asked your grandmother, what happens in the bedroom? And your grandmother said, nothing. She was right. No thing. In a bedroom, you cannot look at things. You cannot bring things. It's just you above all things. It's just us. So what happens in the bedroom? Nothing happens. It's them. They are there without anything between them. And that bond is so powerful that you are now more related to your spouse than you are to your parents. The bond, the nature of the love between husband and wife is more powerful than the bond between parent and child. And that's why when you're married, you are exempt of the mitzvah to honor your parents. Not that you can dishonor them, but you don't have to be there to serve them because you have a new relationship that is more powerful. And that's why parents do not interfere in their children's marriage. But that's a subject for mothers-in-law. We'll leave that for some other time. <laughs> So, build a beautiful mikveh, create a great community. The community bonds around the mikveh. People who use the mikveh are getting into the right rhythm for their marriages, for the children to be welcomed into this world, for the children to love being at home, for the children to feel like they have a mother and father, that they are indebted to, that they are grateful to, who they cannot separate from, and then when they get old enough, you have to push them out the door. That's a Jewish family. That's the way it's meant to be. So we should all have families that are nurturing, that feel completely at home when you come home, and the children should be a source of nachas because things are getting scary, we need nachas from our children. We need nachas from each other. And we need to be satisfying God's investment in us when he asked us to marry him. So if we understand intimacy, we're better Jews. We're better spouses. We're better parents. And have nicer kids. Is that worth a couple of bucks? 
Any questions? Yes. So if you think about it, why don't you have to go to the mikveh when you're pregnant? We know, the, we know the technical reason. But why is it that way? No one is more humble than a pregnant woman. I mean, if that doesn't humble you, being run over by a tractor isn't going to help. Because that's what it feels like. <laughs> A pregnant woman is the most humble creature in the world. She is sharing her space with another being 24 hours. A That's why you're so nauseous. Someone has invaded every inch of your space. So going back to what we were saying before, when you're pregnant, your existence has been devastated, and you are so alive. All things are ruined. 